So please give a warm welcome to Mick Harper. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in this book, we, uh, we were addressing a problem that nobody really thinks about very much, which is uh, how in reasonably sophisticated societies, but where there is no literacy, how people know where to go, how to get about. Uh, imagine y your own problems if you had to get from your home this morning to here uh, with without maps, without atlases, without road signs. Uh, you probably wouldn't have made it. Uh, even if this is your fifth, sixth visit to Glastonbury, you probably wouldn't be able to do it just by memory. Uh, you wouldn't know which motorway exit to take. So, uh, and of course, <laughs> that's with roads. Imagine the Bronze Age where there are no roads, where every journey is going to be slightly different because the river's in spate, there's civil war has blocked off a bit of the countryside. So, how do you know to get where you want to go. This is the scale of the problem. The European Bronze Age, imagine every single, every single bronze implement uh, used, made, buried, in anywhere in Europe for this 2,000 years. Now, every single implement has got one thing in common. It's got 10 or 20% of tin. And that tin came from from Devon and Cornwall. Uh, little tiny bits came from Cyprus, little tiny bits came from uh, Northwest Spain, but 90, 95% of all Bronze Age tin came from the West Coast, uh, from the West Country. The question is, if you've got a bronze foundry, say, here in Lyon, or, or here in Birmingham, or, or you're making bronze cauldrons in Denmark, how, does, how do you get your tin? How do you know how to get to the West Country? How does the West Country know where you are? Well, this is an immense puzzle which nobody actually puzzles about. We came up with a solution in our book, uh, at least just for Britain, which is that you use stone circles. Stone circles are a combination of um, a, a compass and a roundabout and you move from stone circle to stone circle via ley lines. And you know, there's slightly more to it, you'll have to read the book to find the full story, but that's essentially how you get about uh, in Britain. When you're going from ley line to ley line, you eventually uh, arrive at our very famous longest ley line, uh, the Michael line. Uh, this is not an arbitrary, remember most ley lines are fairly arbitrary because you, you choose for yourself where they start and where they end. But there's nothing arbitrary about the Michael line. The Michael line is the longest land line you can draw anywhere across Britain. Uh, but the problem with the Michael line, now, it, it, all of us here probably, it's an article of faith that the Michael line exists. But remember the rest of the world thinks it's complete hooey. They think this is a fantasy. Uh, and we haven't really got very far in proving its existence. Here, here are a couple of the problems. Now, here's why it's called the Michael Line, because it aligns with all these places called Michael, and it runs to Avebury. Uh, so uh, most people say, well, this makes no sense at all. Avebury was built in 3000 BC. Uh, St. Michael, he's a Christian saint. He couldn't have turned up before sort of 500 AD. How can you have a system that combines these two things? Well, uh, we turn the problem on the head, on its head and say, uh, no, no, this is a system that's used whenever, whenever there's no literacy. There's no literacy in 3000 BC. There's no literacy in 500 AD after the Romans left. So you use the same system. What you call the places on the system might change. Remember, who is St. Michael? Well, St. Michael is just the Christian version of, of um, what the Romans called Mercury and, and the Greeks called Hermes. And 
the Scandinavians called um, Wodin, the Egyptians called Thoth. This is all the same character. Uh, so there's, uh, for us, there's, there's no particular difficulty. But now, the, the next problem is, is, is this. Here's the Michael line at the end of it. And uh, we always make a big thing about it, it, it running to St. Michael's Mount. But it doesn't. It, it, it does not align with St. Michael's Mount. In, in, in fact, uh, lots of ley lines don't particularly align with the points that we claim that they do. The enthusiasm, oh yes, it, it runs through this, it runs through that. But if, you, if you're careful, you, you find that it doesn't. And, and this is no exception. Uh, so, sceptics would say, well, look, if it doesn't even align with St. Michael points, you've got nothing. You've got no maths, you've got nothing. But we say the opposite. We say, look, what is the probability uh, that, look, it, it's accepted on all sides that St. Michael's Mount is the chief tin exporting port of the Phoenicians. All the tin that went to the Mediterranean, that fueled the, the Bronze Age civilizations in the Mediterranean, uh, came out via St. Michael's Mount and, and came down here to, to, to the Mediterranean via the Atlantic. Uh, so we say, well, uh, what is the probability uh, that uh, you, you would have the chief the tin exporting port uh, right next to what we claim is the main navigational point? Remember, this is all tin. This is where the tin is produced. How do you find your way, if you've got a tin mine up here in Exmoor, how do you find your way to St. Michael's Mount? What you do is you you follow the, uh, the ley lines until it hits the main ley line, then you follow it down and you can't miss St. Michael's Mount. To us it doesn't matter whether the line runs through, you don't, this is not a pathway, this is a navigational system. So it doesn't matter to us whether it actually passes St. Michael's Mount, as long as you can't miss St. Michael's Mount. But the second bit about St. Michael's Mount, I, I want you to have a look at this because uh, the rest of this talk is, is, is going to be it's going to turn on this factor. Now, to you, that probably looks pretty, touristy, rather nice. But look at it as completely bogus. <coughs> Think of it as, look, it's completely unnatural. Think of it as, look, it's a conical island sitting in a sand of sea, and it's right next uh, to the main uh, ley line. I'm not asking you to believe, but just open in your mind the possibility that this is a completely artificial island. And it's put there specifically to, uh, as the end point of the Michael line. And then that way you can have a look at some of the other conical islands that rise up in flat plains on the Michael line. You'll, you'll be completely familiar, especially with this one, Look, this is my first visit to Glastonbury. So I saw the Glastonbury tour for the first time yesterday, driving in. And I looked at it, I thought, how can anyone believe that that's a natural hill? It's obviously man-made. So, uh, uh, but as I said, we're, uh, we cannot now, I mean, look, the Michael line's been around for 50 years. Uh, it's been argued about for 50 years. Uh, there's nothing I can say to either substantiate or to reject it. What we've got to do is we've got to find another Michael line, uh, this time a Michael line with so much evidence on it that it can't be dismissed. And then by extension, we can start really looking at this Michael line. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, there's only one historical account of a prehistoric trade route and that's written by this guy, Theodorus Siculus, writing about North BC. The inhabitants of that part of Britain, which is called Balerion, Balerion is uh, Devon and Cornwall, prepare the tin, working very carefully the earth in which it is produced. The ground is rocky, but it contains earthy veins, the produce of which is ground down, smelted and purified. In other words, they're not just mining the tin, they're, uh, they're smelting it. They beat the metal into masses shaped like knuckle bones and carry it off to a certain island off Britain called Ictis. Uh, so if we can find Ictis, uh, we can potentially find uh, where this trade route is. And fortunately for us, Diodorus gives us a huge clue. During the ebb of the tide, the intervening space is left dry. 
So we know it's a tidal island. Now, you're all familiar with tidal islands. That is, at high tide, they're cut off from the mainland. At low tide, you can just walk across. Uh, they're so familiar that you kind of forget that they're rather rare. The reason they're rare is because when a tidal island is set up, the conditions are, uh, become very extreme. Tides, currents, uh, in no time at all, the island is either completely cut off from the mainland or, or it's, um, the forces of deposition mean that the island becomes part of the mainland. Uh, so being a, a tidal island is rather unusual. And uh, we can demonstrate this. There are just three tidal islands on the whole of the south coast of Britain. There's Burrow Island, which is near Portsmouth. Uh, there's uh, Berg Island, which is near uh, Plymouth. And there's, uh, of course, St Michael's Mount. So, uh, presumably, one of these is Ictus. And they carry over to the island the tin in abundance in their wagons. Uh, this is an important clue because uh, you cannot use wheeled... Uh, uh, you, you cannot use wagons uh, to cross uh, over to tidal islands normally because it's just wet sand and, and uh, pebbles. Uh, you have to have a causeway. Uh, so... Uh, Diodorus is telling us that this is, a, this is a tidal island with a causeway. Here then, the merchants buy the tin from the natives and carry it over to Gaul. This tells us, yes, it's on the south coast of Britain. And after travelling overland for about 30 days, they finally bring their loads on horses to the mouth of the Rhone. So now uh, we're in a position, uh, we can knock out this one because it's not causeway. These are the two causeway tidal islands both of them are completely connected to the tin zone. The, the way you know where tin was mined in prehistory, uh, you, can, you almost can never find the mines. But you can find the... Uh, to, to smelt tin, you need huge amounts of timber. So everywhere gets deforested in no time, whenever there's a tin industry. Uh, and in these places, the trees have never grown back. Uh, so uh, this is how you know where the tin industry was. Now we've just got to decide between St Michael's Mount and Berg Island. Well, we know about St Michael's Mount. St Michael's Mount uh, takes uh, uh, is the Phoenicians' uh, tin exporting port for the Mediterranean. Uh, we, uh, Diodorus, is talking about going overland. Uh, so it would seem reasonable to uh, choose Berg Island. Remember, we're just being reasonable at the moment. Uh, this is just a hypothesis. Uh, so we'll assume, uh, for the purposes of argument, uh, that it's, uh, Berg Island is the start of this new uh, micro line that we're looking at. Here is, this is the, um, uh, the Great Circle route. Uh, remember, the, the micro line itself is a Great Circle line. It, it looks bent on the, on the map, or it should do, because, because of the curvature of the Earth. Uh, but this is the same as the Michael line. This is completely straight. Uh, and uh, there are several reasons why we think that this is probably the route that Diodorus is referring to. The, the first reason is that uh, this distance, he says, takes 30 days on horseback. This is 450 miles. 50 miles a day uh, on a horse is, is entirely reasonable. Uh, se secondly... Uh, this is, in fact, the shortest distance to the, from the mouth of Rhone to from uh, anywhere in the tin mining zone. Uh, and the third reason is that this, you'll see that from the, the shape of the French coast, this maximises the sea voyage, uh, which uh, you want to do for economic reasons. Uh, so it, it looks as though that this is probably the line we're looking for. Uh, probably. We've, we've got to find some evidence now. Uh, here's, the, here's the maritime bit running from Berg Island to the French coast. And we're going to have a look. Remember, we need, megalith we need megalithic evidence. That uh, So far, this is purely conjecture. We're now going to need physical evidence. So uh, the, the first uh, bit of land, the only bit of land, uh, that uh, this putative Michael Maritime line uh, crosses is here, the island of Guernsey. Uh, now, of course, um, you probably know that Guernsey is a rather mysterious place, uh, especially in a megalithic concept. And, and the strange thing about Guernsey is that 
even though the whole south coast of Britain had two causeway tidal islands, this small island has two causeway tidal islands of its own. Uh, the first one is Leo Island, which you can go and see uh, now. There's a causeway across to it. Uh, but Vale, uh, Vale was, uh, the, this used to be sea. It was filled in in 1806 during the Napoleonic Wars for strategic reasons. But up until 1806, the Vale was a completely separate island uh, with a small causeway in, in between. Uh, so this is very strange. Uh, we have this small island, the only one that Michael Maritime Line runs through. We know that the tin trade is, seems to be associated with causeway tidal islands, and here we have a couple. So uh, let's uh, just think about uh, these three causeway tidal islands. The first thing is they've all got a Michael connection, a very strong Michael connection. Berg Island was called Michael Island up until the 18th century. We, we don't know why it changed its name, but we do know from loads and loads of historical records that it was called Michael Island. Uh, the Vale, uh, its full name is St. Michel Duval. Uh, Leo Island is, uh, has only been populated by Michael monks. No, nobody's ever lived on Leo Island apart from monks uh, from various Michael monasteries, St. Michael monasteries. Uh, so that's, that's a close connection. But uh, there's another uh, rather strange coincidence between these three islands, uh, which is that uh, they have the same pattern, same very curious pattern. They have, uh, here is Berg Island, they have the mainland, they have the causeway, uh, they have a church building uh, dominating the island end of the causeway. Uh, here's Leo Island, uh, and here is the Vale. Uh, this... Uh, this is uh, a hermitage, uh, this is a priory, uh, this is a full-grown monastery. Uh, but uh, there doesn't seem any religious reason for this, so we assume it's a quasi-megalithic reason. However, uh, these three islands, looked at from a maritime, from a sailor's point of view, uh, these three islands are, are, are completely different. We know that Berg Island is surrounded by sand. And we, we also know that the megalithics, the ancients, call them what you like, uh, they, uh, they never used ports or harbours, docks, jetties. They never used anything. What they used was uh, sand. Essentially, they just sailed their ships in and they beached the ships on sand or something similar. That's how they... And then they waited for the tide to float them off. So, uh, and we know this from St. Michael's Mount, which, remember, it's completely surrounded, those of you who have been there will know, it's completely surrounded by sand. So is Berg Island, because Berg Island is just a tin exporting port. On the other hand, Leo Island is the opposite. Leo Island is completely surrounded by rocks. You wouldn't, if you're a sailor, you wouldn't want to get within two miles of Leo Island. The Vale is something different again, and something rather mysterious because the causeway uh, uh, has opened up this bay, uh, which I'll show you, this is the modern, modern picture of it, and it's called Grand Havre, which means big harbour, great haven, and we don't know why. It's a very mysterious name because there's nothing, there's a tiny little fisherman's wharf there and a, a little tiny jetty there, but for some reason this is called uh, Grand Half, and we don't know why. But, at the end of the talk, uh, we'll learn why. Uh, so, uh, this gives us the basis of our Michael Maritime Line. So far, it's just straws in the wind. Let's see what else we can find. Here it is, it carries on. The next, so, uh, look, look, looking at this from the point of view of being a sailor, you, you, you sail off with your boatload of tin, and uh, you, you, you get past Guernsey. Uh, next thing you've got to worry about is passing Jersey safely. And here is another causeway tidal island, right on this corner called La Corbiere. It's got a huge lighthouse on it now. Uh, it's just the same as Leo Island. It's surrounded by rocks, and you've got to keep away. Uh, so now we've got causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island. The next uh, thing that the 
the line runs through is this archipelago called the Chorzy Islands. Now these are among the strangest islands in the world. They are absolutely extraordinary. The, if you read this, the archipelago comprises 365 islands at low tide uh, compared to 52 islands at high tide. From a few dozen acres above the high tide line, the archipelago increases to around 5,000 acres at low, low water over an area of roughly 30 square miles. Imagine, at low tide, it's huge. At high tide, it practically disappears. In other words, these are tidal islands, par excellence. But that's not, that's not the, the most curious thing about it. The most curious thing is this name, Chorzy. Chorzy is the French uh, version, uh, sorry, Chorzy is the English version of the French Chorzy, means causeway. So we have causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island, causeway tidal island, tidal islands called causeway. This is, now, this is very strange. Some explanations will be forthcoming. Uh, at the moment, just imagine this is a set of coincidences. Uh, now, uh, we've only got one more point, and that is uh, we now reach the French coast. Uh, now, obviously, we would, theoretically, we, we'd like a nice uh, tidal causeway island with a Michael connection. Uh, very fortunately, here we have Mont Saint-Michel, the most famous causeway tidal island in the world with Michael in its name. And the line runs straight over it. So, uh, is this enough? Well, by the general level of proofs of archaeology, uh, it, it normally would, but of course nobody's going to take it seriously unless uh, we can explain how this system works. Uh, so, we're now going to set about explaining how the system works uh, from a mariner's point of view. To understand the next uh, passage, you're, you're going to have to ransack your memories uh, for every single visit you've made to the seaside. Uh, and all those times you, uh, you were at a rock pool, paddling in it probably, uh, can you remember that? All those times? Uh, rock pools? Very, very common. In Britain, anywhere in the world. Uh, now, remember, can you remember a rock pool where uh, it came up to your knees? That's rather rare. Rock pools are very shallow. But occasionally, rock pools get a little bit deep, and uh, actually, as a child, you probably got a bit worried. Now, I want you to really ransack your memories and try to remember a rock pool where the water went over your head. In fact, the rock pool was eight, ten feet deep. It was big enough, not just for you, but for maybe a dozen other people to swim about in. It had nice flat rocks nearby where you could get in and get out. Yes? Well, uh, most of you won't be able to remember because these don't exist in nature, as far as we know. They they exist in megalithic contexts, but they don't, they don't exist in nature. Here's one. Oops, sorry. Uh, the Mermaid Pool, Berg Island. All right, so the start of the Michael line, we've got one of these strange, huge pools that are practically unknown in the world. Not only that, but it's situated on the island uh, directly at the start of the Michael Line. Remember, the Michael Line runs down here to Guernsey. Uh, so for some curious reason, there is this huge pool uh, at the start of the Michael Line. It runs down to Leo Island. Here is the Venus Pool in Leo Island. Uh, again, you'll see that it's here at this corner of the island, pointing back towards Berg Island. Uh, this is a I think you would agree this is beyond coincidence, given that these are virtually unknown in the, in the world. We're not talking about common features. Uh, so uh, you'll remember that the Michael Line now crosses Guernsey, the corner of Guernsey, uh, and it comes out uh, here at a place called Corbier Point. I can't show you a photo of this Venus pool, but I can prove it exists. This is the 
the official Societe Guernesiaise uh, comment on it. The Venus Pool on the south coast is at La Havre de Bon Repos, just to the west of Corbier Point. The path down has fallen to the beach, so it's impossible to get down without a rope unless from Le Provote a little further to the west. And then go over the rocks at low tide. The descent is also pretty hair raising. It got worse about 10 years ago after a small landslide. In other words, nobody visits it. It's, uh, that's why I can't get it. I can't persuade anyone to go and take a photo of it. But anyway, look, uh, the essential thing is we've got uh, three, uh, we call them Venus pools now. Uh, we've got three Venus pools on the, on the Michael line. As we know, the Michael line carries on uh, to pass La Corbière. Here is the Venus pool at La Corbière. I put it in quotes because, as you'll see, it's, uh, it's completely full of seaweed and rocks. Uh, this is not a tourist area, uh, so it's not kept clear for swimmers uh, as Leo Island and Berg Island are. Uh, but this, uh, this is almost certainly a, a Venus pool. Just, it needs some archaeological work. Uh, so now we've got... Uh, we've, got four, uh, we, we've got four of these Venus pools. Uh, th there may be uh, uh, ones down here. I, I haven't been able to find out. Uh, but, th but this is plenty to get on with. Now, the question is, how do Venus pools help you navigate? Look, <laughs> you can't see a Venus pool from more than five feet away. So how do you see it from 10 miles away? Well, the megalithics are... Uh, they're a bunch of geniuses. Look, uh, well, we, we can work out the method. Uh, here is a Corbier point, a La Corbier. Uh, they're, they're connected not only by the Michael line, but by Venus pools. So we can be pretty sure that's not a coincidence. And that the solution lies somewhere to do with Corbiers. Now, what does Corbier mean? Uh, it means place of crows. Uh, crows. Now, those of you who have read Megalithic Empire will know that we're very, we're very fond of the crow family. They, they help the megalith, all, all the, the, the various, the jackdaws, the rooks, um, the carrion crow. They all, they all help megalithics in various ways, which you, you have to buy the book to find out about. But these, uh, these uh, place of crows, uh, well, crows turn up in two. Uh, two situations that are relevant to us. The first is the phrase, as the crow flies. That means, as the crow flies, means in straight lines over long distances, which is the very problem we're trying to solve. Uh, the second time crows turn up is in the phrase, a crow's nest. Every sailing ship had a crow's nest at the top of the mast. Uh, nowadays, we think of the cabin boy being up there with a spyglass. But uh, we have historical evidence that they were actually used for birds. Now, there's nothing surprising about this because all maritime cultures use birds uh, for navigation. The Polynesians uh, use it in the Pacific. Uh, the Vikings uh, observe the flight of birds to help them navigate. Of course, uh, Christopher Columbus used birds. Uh, it's even in the Bible with Noah and his stub. Uh, so this, uh, but, as usual, the megalithics raised the whole thing uh, to, to, a, to a science. What they did was they took the sea, what's called the sea crow. The sea crow is a cormorant. Although we, today, know that it's not a member of the crow family, the ancients thought cormorants were crows. We know that because the word cormorant, cor, corvid, crow, marine, of the sea. Cormorant means crow of the sea. So we know that these are, well, uh, we assume uh, that the megalithics are using cormorants. How are the cormorants going to help you in navigating? Well, it's simplicity itself. What you do is wherever you want cormorants to fly, whatever line you want them to fly, you just dig them a nice deep hole, about 8 to 10 feet deep, because that's how deep cormorants dive. You then make sure that you build them up the high tide point and you put uh, fish bait in. Twice a day, twice a day, high tide rushes into the pool, fish come in, gorge on the bait. Twice a day, the tide goes out, uh, leaving the fish happily trapped in the pool, munching away, 
the pool, remember, the pool is translucent. It's got a steel surface as, as soon as the tide's gone out. It, it's, what a, a, it's what a cormorant would think of as um, shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, there is this beautiful, lovely pool full of fish. And all it has to do is dive in, disgorge itself. Uh, so uh, cormorants uh, are going to quite like this arrangement. Uh, but, of course, uh, the fish is still going to be eaten up by the cormorants. The, the tide is going to come back. Uh, and the cormorant's going to have to fly on to the next one. Uh, but very soon, you're going to get a whole bunch of cormorants uh, flying all the way along looking for these wondrous cormorant pools. And in case you're worried that the poor old cormorant's got so far to, to fly, uh, here or here, well, uh, remember, uh, there are uh, megalithic boats uh, plying their trade all the way along, following the cormorants uh, with crow's nests. So uh, the cormorants, any time they like, they can just flop down on the boat, take a rest. Uh, or, or if you're a megalithic sailor, you can have your own cormorant. I'm sure they do and just send off the cormorant, look, uh, go and find the next Venus pool. So that is how, that is how the system operated. Uh, as usual with megalithic solutions, it's always the same. They're prepared to pay, they're prepared to invest a lot of money to set up the system. If, if you think about every megalithic thing you know about, you know it costs money and time to put it up. But it then lasts forever. And it doesn't need any maintenance. These, this is the same principle. Uh, you need people putting fish bait in from time to time. But remember, these are, every one of these islands has got a nice little um, religious community. Uh, so putting fish bait in occasionally is not going to be a problem. Uh, so. That is basically how the tin, so now we know, we think we know, how the tin was exported. We know that uh, it's via uh, St. Michael's Mount, via the Atlantic, and now we have our new route uh, from Berg Island uh, over to the continent. Uh, but there's something missing. There's no point in exporting tin on its own. Tin is completely useless. You've got to export copper. You, you cannot turn up. Uh, you, you might be able to do it in the Roman Empire when the markets are very sophisticated, but in the Bronze Age, there's just absolutely no point in turning up with a shipload of tin. You've got to turn up with a shipload of tin and copper. So, we've got to find a copper route. Now, by an amazing coincidence, the largest copper mine in the whole of antiquity is up here, uh, Clandudno, Orm's Head. Uh, even as late as the 19th century, the biggest copper mine was uh, Paris Mountain on, on Anglesey. So this is, a, this is a real copper area. Uh, down here, uh, we've got a smaller copper area, uh, but this is important from a megalithic point of view because it's the only place, uh, we think, in the world where copper and tin uh, coexist very close to each other. So those of you who are researching, I know uh, I've met quite a few of you who are researching this area uh, where there's... Um, uh, Tintagel, uh, Lundy Island, uh, Padstow, uh, uh, what's it, Peninsula. Uh, this is a megalithic hotspot, but I, I'm not going to go into it here. Uh, the point to, uh, this is a, the point is that the megalithics liked straight overland routes. Uh, probably uh, some of you know about the perpetual choir system. Uh, which is around here. But uh, again, I, I won't go into this. The point is that the copper uh, is taken from these areas, and the, uh, the most convenient place to remember this is, the, this is where the tin trade is going on down here. Uh, the most uh, convenient place is uh, Weymouth. Actually, it won't be Weymouth because remember I told you megalithics never used harbours, but uh, remember we're, we'll use Weymouth as our, uh, as our launch point. Uh, nothing much changes over the, over the. I mean, these are, these are the modern. These are, are the modern uh, ferry routes: Plymouth, Roscoff, uh, Portsmouth, Cherbourg, uh, and Weymouth to Marlow. Weymouth to St. Marlow, uh, still going strong. It was going strong through the Middle Ages, 
uh, it just never stops. Uh, so we're going to concentrate on uh, Weymouth to St. Marlow. We'll, we'll start, this time we'll start from the other way. Uh, here's St. Marlow. Now, it looks megalithic. I haven't been there, I haven't researched it. This is all the evidence I've got. But look, this looks as though it might have, uh, this has all been developed, of course, hugely, massively over the, in modern times. Uh, but it looks as though it might have been uh, some sort of causeway tidal line at once. Uh, but more important, uh, the megalithics are completely obsessed by tides. And this is the world's greatest tidal estuary. This is the Rance uh, uh, Tidal Power Station, the, the most powerful in the world, the first one in the world. So um, uh, we can take it that St. Marlow is pretty megalithic. It's even got um, a couple, of, we think, a couple of Venus pools. Whether they are Venus pools, we don't know. I haven't been able to investigate. But we'll, we'll, we'll take some more as a convenient start point. Uh, so now, we, we remember, this is the route that we did ending in Mont Saint-Michel. Uh, that was the tin route. We're now going to do the copper route, which is like this. The first thing to see is that uh, we come across the Minkis. Now look, the Minkis Plateau extends for more than 100 square kilometres at low tide, decreasing to a few emergent rocks at high tide. In other words, for some unaccountable reason, we've got this really bizarre situation here, as we had here with the Chorzy Islands. So what is it? Well, it's quite obvious. Uh, one of the great problems of um, uh, export, uh, he heavy exports is to find the return carbon. Uh, it, it's always a problem. But now we know what the return cargo is. The return cargo uh, is granite. These are made of... All these irons are made of granite. Uh, so what you did, you, you took your tin or your copper, and on your return journey, it, it might be that you just needed it as ballast. Uh, but anyway, you needed something for the return journey. Uh, and you either uh, mined granite from the Chorzy Islands or you mined it from the Minkis. And over 3,000 years of mining these islands, these granite, they're, they're, they're just pure granite. Uh, they come down to the water line. So after 3,000, what you see now is just the detritus of 3,000 years of quarrying granite. Uh, now, it's just, so once you get past Minkies, your next uh, problem is getting past Jersey. Now we know what to look for. We look for the southernmost tip of Jersey, and uh, here it is, uh, La Motte. La Motte is a tidal island. But Le Mans is also our introduction uh, to a new form of tidal island. Uh, the word Mott, you, you, you probably know it in the phrase uh, Mott and Bailey Castle. A Mott and Bailey Castle is a, is a, 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 a castle with, with a bailey around it built on a Mott. A Mott means an artificial mound. So in other words, Mott means artificial mound. If you name an island the artificial mound, well, it's quite likely to be an artificial mound. <laughs> we we, uh, we confirm this by look. The island has grassy surface and is predominantly clay surrounded by rocks. In other words, you take the rocks out, probably granite blocks brought from uh, the Minkies, uh, you just take them out, uh, you, 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 you put the rocks down, uh, then you put the, the clay in and you grass it over. In recent times, efforts have been made to reduce erosion of the island by the construction of walls. In other words, after 3,000 years or, or whatever it is, it, it's beginning to show its age because it's not, it's a building. Uh, but that's uh, perhaps not the, the most exciting thing about this, uh, La Motte, is uh, we are introduced to the jelly mold. This is called the jelly mold and it's a megalithic shape which, is gonna, which turns up time and time again. Uh, and it's a sure sign of artificiality. Not just that, uh, there are islands on either side, and these, we assume, tell the approaching mariner, remember that this, this, the ship is coming from the other side, coming from France. Uh, he can tell by this arrangement of rocks which, which side to pass, which is safe. Well, I can't tell you any more than that. Uh, so uh, that is Lamont. Now, which side do you pass? Well, 
uh, when you get to Lamont, the, the most direct route is, is, is to pass east of Jersey up here. The trouble is, uh, the race is, is probably the most dangerous stretch of water um, in, anywhere in the channel. Uh, the Cascades is the most <laughs> treacherous bunch of rocks in the channel. Um, and uh, Alderney uh, bars the way in between. So going this way around is uh, very, very uh, dangerous, not advised. However, if you do want to do it, here we have the, at the very uh, eastern end of Alderney, we have what, well, of course, it's a causeway tidal island called Fort Home Hill. So now, well, we've got a bit of a parting of the ways because, look, we know that causeway tie lines are pretty rare. Uh, orthodoxy, both archaeologists and geologists and geographers, they think every single one in the world is natural. And yet, here we have the Channel Islands, and at every point, whether it's the Vale, which is the most uh, northwesterly, Leo Island, which is the most westerly, La Colbière, the most southwesterly, La Motte, the most southerly, uh, Fort Hermé, uh, the most northeasterly, at every single point, we have a causeway tidal island. Whichever way you approach the Channel Islands from, you're going to you're going to confront a tidal causeway island. Now, there is no way in the world that that could be natural. <laughs> Nature is just not that generous. If it's not natural, you have to accept that man made the islands. Now, I'm not saying that man made these islands in the way they made uh, La Motte. You can make a tidal island just by digging out the channel in, in, a, in, a, in a headland. There are, there are lots of ways of making tidal islands. But the truth is that these are uh, probably man... Well, uh, they must be humanly engineered in some sense. So, but let's return to our journey. So we've decided if it's unsafe going this way, it's safer to go this way. Now we know what... By now we know we can make, start making predictions. Look. There's a Venus pool here, so uh, you go past the Venus pool. We know there's a Venus pool here and here, but we don't want to go this way. We don't want to go to uh, Berg Island. We're going to Weymouth up here. So we head for Sark. So what do we expect at the very southernmost point of Sark? There it is. Look, Venus pool. Remember. Geologists think this is natural. Here we have the Venus pool, exactly on cue. Sark, very interesting megalithically. Not Sark Island itself, that's why we're gone. But these two islands, one at the very southerly end, one at the most westerly end. This is Little Sark, and I'll show you Little Sark. Uh, here's the uh, Venus pool, but this is the interesting way. This, Little Sark is not a causeway tidal island, it's a strangely causeway island, which we're going to come to more often now. Look, look at the, uh, this, this is the connection. In the 19th century, uh, when it was a bit windy, you had to crawl on hands and knees across this. Uh, the only thing like it, uh, apart from the Great Wall of China perhaps, uh, the only thing, uh, those of you who have been to Tintagel will recognise that this is rather similar to the connection there. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, this is why we assume, both because it's got a Venus pool and because it's got this very strange causeway, we assume uh, that uh, uh, Little Sark is a megalithic island. The other island is Breku. Now, unfortunately about Breku, you probably know, it's privately owned by the Barclay brothers, who, who own the Daily Telegraph, uh, and they're complete bastards. And <laughs> Have I said something funny? Um, and uh, so we can't find out anything about Breku, whether it's got a Venus pool or whatever. But uh, we're pretty sure that it's got a strange causeway connection because here's this little island where the causeway presumably used to be or might have been. Uh, here, uh, there are some of the most extraordinary uh, maritime caves um, uh, you'll, you'll find anywhere. And uh, those of you who, who have um, investigated uh, islands around Britain will know uh, that um, caves and blowholes uh, are, are very important megalithically. I, I don't know why, uh, but they turn up 
so often in megalithic contexts that they must have a, uh, they must have a cause. Uh, but anyway, we, we assume that Breku uh, is a, a megalithic island uh, because uh, here's what it looks like. Remember, here's the, uh, the old um, uh, the shape uh, with, the, with the islands at each end. Uh, and it looks exactly like uh, the, the two Gao Peninsula. These are both Causeway Tidal Islands uh, and the Gao Peninsula. Uh, here's Worm's Head. Remember, uh, Worm's Head and Orm's Head, uh, Worm and Orm means dragon. Uh, wherever you say the word Worm or, or Orm, uh, at the end of the Michael line, where it hits the coast of Norfolk, that's Ormsby St. Michael. Can't be clearer than that. Anyway, so these, are, uh, th these will demonstrate that these, these are all probably artificial. So um, now, uh, of course, we can't, we can't go past Sark. Uh, we're worried about the caskets. This is very dangerous. So uh, we're going to need to be... Uh, pushed aside to Jetto. Jetto. Now, uh, Jetto is uh, probably the most mysterious megalithic island in the world. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to get slightly mystical, something I don't normally do. But um, uh, Jetto uh, is, is weird. First of all, we know, well, look. First of all, here's the jelly mold shape. Here are the rocks. Classic megalithic made island. We know it's got a Venus pool. Again, this is privately owned, so we can't take photos. But look, continuing along the path, a notice on the left indicates the path leading down to a large rock pool, which is a natural formation, ho-ho, deepened by the present tenants by blocking outlets. The pool, in a position sheltered from most wind, winds, is always deep enough for a swim and is useful when the tide is too low on the nearby beach. Uh, this was written about 60 years ago. It's obviously a Venus pool. Uh, now, uh, the strangest thing, perhaps, uh, about Jetto, uh, try to, uh, well, you're all familiar with the Dark Ages and, and the fact that there's just no historical evidence for anything anywhere. I mean, you know, we're talking about tiny slippets of, 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 of information surviving. So it's extraordinary that we've actually got some historical evidence about this completely obscure, tiny, uninhabited island. Look. This is the causeway between, this is Jetto and this is Herm. The first research, the first records of Herm's inhabitants in historic times are from the 6th century when the island became a centre of monastic activity. The name Herm supposedly derives from hermits. No, it doesn't. It derives from Hermes. Hermits are servants of Hermes. Wherever you see hermits, hermitages, think megalithic. However, the monks suffered from the inclement Atlantic. In 709, a storm washed away the strip of land which connected the island with the small uninhabited island of Jetto. Now, can you imagine? This is uninhabited. These are hermits. Can you imagine a less important thing than, uh, than the passage going to an uninhabited island uh, is washed away? <laughs> Not only did they record this, but it's been carefully preserved uh, for, a th uh, for more than a thousand years. Uh, this is absolutely bizarre. Uh, and the only real explanation is that these her hermits, they are on Herm because of Jetto. They are there because of this causeway. This causeway is absolutely essential to something. Now what, we're now going to find out. The omphalos. Now, of course, the omphalos mean is Greek for uh, belly button. And uh, all the ancient, for some reason, all the ancients were crazy about omphaloses. It just means the centre uh, of, of your system. And so Jerusalem was normally the omphalos of, of Mapamundi. Now, uh, it, it appears that Jetto is the omphalos. You can see it's right in the centre uh, of the Channel Islands. But it has the most peculiar relationship to Maiden Castle. Remember, uh, here's Jetto, here's Maiden Castle. Uh, Maiden Castle is the largest uh, Iron Age hillfall in the world. No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly an amazing part. I'm not just, you know, uh, plucking out at random. Uh, actually, I probably am, but. 
here is the maiden, here's Maiden Castle, here's Jetta. Now, the most extraordinary thing about them is they're identical. They're exactly the same size, they're exactly the same shape. If you took Maiden Castle and plonked it into the English Channel, you'd have Jetta. If you took Jetta out and plonked it on the Dorset, into the Dorset countryside, uh, you'd have Maiden Castle. Uh, not only that, they are, they form a meridian. I mean, I don't mean just vaguely. I mean, if you draw a north-south line to within a few feet, you go via the causeway between Jetta and Herm, and you arrive, remember Maiden Castle is called a, a, a causeway enclosure. You arrive at the causeway of Maiden Castle, the bit at the eastern end, which is, well, most of you all know this. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is 80 odd miles over sea, but somehow it's been surveyed within a few feet. If, if this is true, I mean, uh, I agree, it may be entirely imaginary, but anyway. The reason we know it's not imaginary is because it goes from this essential causeway to this essential causeway via Portland's causeway. I mean, I don't mean roughly. I mean, this is... Hattie has computed this within inches, is it? Feet? Uh, now, you, you heard uh, this morning uh, our comrade uh, telling you of the importance of Portland. Uh, Portland, he claims, uh, uh, Gary uh, claims, is the, one of the most important megalithic islands in the world. Who am I to disagree? Here, here is Portland. It's absolutely packed full. But why is the causeway so important? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, he, he was saying about the, the connection with the Etruscans, and uh, it was quite interesting, but well, no, more than in, quite interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, but I was more interested in the fact that what the ships returning look for? Remember, they're coming up this uh, meridian. And it, it, remember, the meridian also goes in and, and goes up to our spot where we thought that the perpetual choirs were. Oops. Well, the reason it goes here, here, the line goes through here, is because we now have the world's strangest causeway. There's no question that this is the world's strangest. I mean, I, I think, Gary, is this correct? This is the, sorry. This is the strangest causeway in the world. It's called Chesil Beach. It's, what, 15 miles long? Uh, we say, remember, megalithics need sandbanks to put their boats on. This is absolutely perfect. It's actually shingle, but it's just as gentle on boats. Uh, so it doesn't matter what the state of tide, what the state of the wind, you can just sail in any way you like here. But if conditions are bad on this side, you can always go to the other side of Portland. Here is another extraordinary feature called Weymouth Bay. And those of you who have been to Weymouth will know that Weymouth Bay is just the most perfect sandy beach. It just goes out for miles. It's not a, a rock in sight. It's, it's just absolutely wonderful. So uh, now we come to the very... Uh, last feature uh, of, of this grand plan of Megalithia. Uh, there's boats coming with copper this way. There are boats coming with tin this way. Uh, they've got to find somewhere to start trading. The first place they come to is Grand Havre, facing both, both parts. So they just sail into Grand, Grand Havre, that's why it's called Grand Havre, and they if you've got tin, you take copper. If you've got copper, you take tin. And then you sail on. If you're coming the other way, you're going to St Albans Bay. If you're coming from this direction and you want to uh, you, you trade between the two routes, you're going to St Albans Bay. Why do we know it's St Albans Bay? Well, first of all, St Alban, the, the family of St Albans own uh, St Michael's Mount, uh, for you conspiracy theorists. Uh, the second reason is that uh, St Albans Bay is like Weymouth Bay, it is just pure sand, it's just wonderful, you just ride straight in and beach your boat. Uh, it's also the only, uh, actually there's one other, but it's virtually the only bay in the world 
which has got two causeway tidal islands at either end. Elizabeth Castle, St Albans Fort. Is that a coincidence or is it a megalithic arrangement? Well, you'll have to make your own mind up. So uh, that's the end. Okay.